Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the THO Movie Reviews podcast, the show where we bring you passionate, honest, and insightful film criticism. I'm your host, Bennett Campbell Ferguson. I'm here today at Rose City Coffee Co. to uh, talk about Isle of Dogs uh, with my colleague Mo Shawnette. Mo, it's been four years uh, <laughs> since we got a Wes Anderson movie. I know oh Grand God. Budapest Has was it your favorite movie. Yeah! That was, that was, Grand Budapest was your favorite movie of it was, 14. Yeah. Are, are you. Uh, uh, do you feel like you can finally exhale? <laughs> I don't. I wasn't. I, I'm not going to say I was holding my breath. Um, I, 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 as much as I like Wes Anderson, I understand that his appeal is very specified. Let's say. <laughs> well, everything about him is specified. A- absolutely. absolutely. So, I, you know, I saw this. I was definitely apprehensive when I saw the trailers for Isle of Dogs because just this idea. One of the, I, I, one of my favorite things about uh, Grand Budapest, and we'll get into this issue later in the podcast. But one of my favorite things about Grand Budapest is that it's removed from any sort of actual nation. Right. It's able to tell the story like it through allegory and through through coding. Or it's in a made up country, and there's a there's a Nazi force, but it, instead not, of a swastika, it's like two like Z's yeah, or something and, on a and flag. You don't, and you don't have to like specifically make them Nazi so you don't have to think about the larger implications of what happened. Right. Whereas um, Isle of Dogs, you know, yes, it's future Japan, but it's But it's still, still Japan. like, Japan. So, I was nervous about what would happen um, having come out of it. I, I think I liked it, but I can see some of my fears were founded, and it's, it's still, it's flawed. It's, it's not his best one. <laughs> yeah, I, I would agree with that. I mean, the uh, there were a lot of things I liked about it, but but overall I definitely had a number of problems, and the you know some of them I think speak to what you're talking about. But I also had some issues with the uh, uh, actually with the the writing as well, like because uh, you know one thing I've noticed like ever since uh, Fantastic Mr. Fox, there's a real tightness to his script. Like there's usually there's there's a there's a nice tight focus on like a lead character or maybe two lead characters, mm-hmm. and they have a goal they want to accomplish and it uh, it feels like uh, like very contained whether you know it's you know Ray Fiennes and Tony Revolori you know going through this crazy series of escapes in the Grand Budapest Hotel or you know uh, the foxes you know having to dig this way and and that and you know constantly trying to get out of trouble and fantastic Mr. Fox. And, like, Isle of Dogs is, like, there were kind of some moments where I was, like, like, what the heck is going on? <laughs> Why is this part in here? Like, Scarlett Johansson shows up as, uh, you know, the only dog on this, this trash island where all the dogs are. And, like, she she's really only in two major scenes. I was kind of, like... Like, why is she here? She's actually yeah. not, like, part of the story. She like, really, it's a little messy. She's very... She feels... She, her character, and I don't, I don't want to slam Scarlett Johansson because she does a good job in this. No, she like, does all a good the job with what she's do. given. Yeah, yeah but okay. it's, it's definitely her character is kind of just there to, as a source of motivation. Yeah. For, for Chief, for Brian Cranston's character. Yeah. And that feels. And, and I don't even know like, like what that motivation is meant to be because even that. It, is it's like, say, help the kid because he's a kid and you're, that's what dogs are supposed to do. Sure. I guess. But it's like, it's it's just like something she tells him, like, yeah. as opposed to like something he really like feels in his guts. And, you know, I, um, yeah, for me, it's, one of the things I do like about, like, about my favorite Wes Anderson movies is that there is a central idea to him. There's, there is this theme of it, you know, Fantastic Mr. Fox is one of my all-time favorites, and there's this celebration of the ordinary that's there that I really that I love that's there in the aesthetic of it it's there in the story it's even it's, these apples look fake but at least they have stars on them. <laughs> exactly exactly and then Grand Budapest Hotel it's this tribute to this sort of old world this old style of manners and and and, and upkeep that Ray Fine's character entirely represented and how that kind of He's kind of not there, and that spark is gone from the world. Yeah. And that's and there's like an innate tragedy of that, but we can live. It can live on through these stories, um, and that was missing from Isle of Dogs. The most like the biggest 
moral I can take away with our dogs are good. <laughs> Which I can, I can get behind that moral. I just don't know if you want to devote two hours of stop motion animation to that moral. Yes, yeah. You, you know, I'm a, 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 a co worker of mine, like, you know, he was. He was talking about about the idea of like you know the the dogs are are being rounded up and, and put on the side and he was saying it was like a commentary on just like how society treats oppressed peoples but but you know like even that even though I I kind of got his drift I, I I still didn't quite buy it because I I feel like I I just I felt like okay I, I get that you know Wes Anderson may, is maybe taking inspiration from real life but at the same time. I didn't get that he was, like, saying anything particularly interesting or dramatic about that. It was, you know? it was codings, I guess, but it wasn't allegorical. I didn't. No, I, there, no. I don't think there was any intent to like make a one-to-one comparison. It was just like we'll do a story about government corruption because I guess that's interesting. That's yeah. what he liked. Well, and like you, you, you I, I feel like you can't just like, you know in a movie take a situation like that and say like this is how society treats the oppressed it, there has to be an and you know kind of like you know the Grand Budapest Hotel isn't just about oh people are nostalgic it's also people are nostalgic and every era is longing for something that's gone because yeah. even Ray Fiennes is trying you know that, that line and I think we talked about this in our, our video in that movie like um, uh, that was four years ago. Four years, Holy that's smokes! That's crazy. That's crazy. That's how long it makes it, it takes to do stop motion. I know. Yeah, <laughs> but F. Murray Abraham said that you know uh, his world was gone a long time ago. So even Ray Fiennes is longing for something that's that's gone, and that idea of these echoes and and like it, as you said, like where was that central idea in Isle of Dogs? There was no idea like that. It's almost like he just had a bunch of like gizmos and. <laughs> tricks he kind of wanted to string into one thing. It feels like, like someone else pointed it, a lot of critics have pointed this out and I think that this is sort of this is the strongest part of the movie is that it feels like he's challenging himself as a director because everything, all of his movies, there's definitely the sense of like very specified aesthetic, this very innate beauty uh, uh, and artificiality in all of it and the artificiality is, is literally almost always like the source of the joke. It's like he's like, I'm gonna embrace the fakeness and and make you laugh at it. Exactly. But Isle of Dogs, the difference is he's trying to apply that to what is essentially a wasteland. It, it's right. not necessarily trying to find the specificity and the 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 exactness of garbage, literal garbage. <laughs> and that is interesting and that makes for a really great visual aesthetic. Uh, and this, I, we, we've been, you know, talking crap about this movie, but it looks gorgeous. Oh, absolutely. It no is, question. It's an amazing feat of animation, and they deserve all the credit for that. Yeah. Well, I, and I mean, one thing that I think is really remarkable is about his animation is that uh, things never seem, they never seem either too stiff or too slick. You know, yeah. he, he never loses that that handmade quality but there's a real like a fluidity and agility to the way these uh, these characters move I mean they truly come to life there's someone who descri- who uh, there was a review I read of Fantastic Mr. Fox a while ago and one of the things they point out was you can almost see the fingerprints of the people moving the puppets in between shots sure yeah. and you can, and you get the same sense here like the way the dog's hair moves like it's it looks like someone kind of nudged it when they were moving the puppets and right, never bothered right. to fix it. And there's that that unreality just kind of, it works for it. it. It works for this movie. He, I say what you will, but he knows how to create an aesthetic. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I, Him absolutely. and his team of animators, I should say. Right. <laughs> well, like, uh, because of this movie, I've been re-watching a lot of his movies, and uh, it, it's like, it's so interesting how... Like every every movie he creates truly is like a whole universe. Like a like in the Life Aquatic, for instance, there is no like actual wildlife in that movie. <laughs> Only creatures he made up. Like there's that scene where um, uh, uh, Bill Murray or Angelica Houston says, "Oh look, the sugar crabs are mating," <laughs> and then you get like you cut to these like 
like fake looking spotted crabs made by Henry Selleck that are like going at each other on the beach <laughs> and it's like that's so great you know like I, I know like some people think his movies are like they're too stiff or they're, they're too uh, practiced but for me like that's exactly the the appeal that's that's, that's why we keep coming back isn't it yeah um I'll, I'll also give it up for the voice cast yeah um I <laughs> is it, it, Brian Cranston absolutely does not need any more praise heaped on him, but I'll do it anyway. He was great, yeah. He's, like, he disappears into the role. Like, it's, I, I know, like, he's vo- it's his voice, but... Right. I'm, I'm someone who watched all five seasons of Breaking Bad multiple times. I watched Malcolm in the Middle a ton. Uh, I'm a huge fan of this guy, and it's... Uh, he plays both sides of this character really well. He plays this, this sort of, the angry, mangy dog who's just trying to who lives through violence and lives through he barely survives but he does survive yes uh, yeah. and then like later the softer more intimate moments the more caring aspect of it he he sells it both times and you kind of you almost forget that he's you know a huge this huge star it's just he inhabits the character this is a real transformation yeah I, I so I almost didn't recognize Liev Schreiber, but yeah, I, I yeah, haven't I heard his spots. <laughs> I, I haven't heard his voice a bunch. Um, all, uh, all the Japanese actors whose names I am not remembering, and I feel terrible about that. Um, I'm gonna pull those up right now. But they did, they all did a great job. Uh, yeah, it's he. Uh, the other thing about Wes Anderson, he knows how to pull together a cast. Yeah, absolutely. I think the only thing like I would. I could find to criticize about the cast is that, like, there are some of those actors I felt like he squeezed in there, like, just because maybe he felt he had to. Yeah. Like, uh, like the Bill Murray dog, like, like I don't you even could, know that that dog needed to be there. You could you definitely know, like, cut at least one of the dogs from the main pack if yeah, the story doesn't yeah. go anywhere. I think maybe you could cut any of them except the Jeff Goldblum one. Jeff Goldblum that or Ed awesome. Norton. <laughs> Because yeah, the Ed yeah. Norton dog, he just he's just sounds like Ed Norton, kind of right, just right. woke up. I don't even remember much about that character. He, he's the like, he is the one who's just he, he's mostly like the voice of reason and kind of the the leader among a group that doesn't have leaders. Right, right. And it you, you do need that character there. So. But it feels like even that idea, like they, they didn't like run with it far enough. Like there wasn't. It wasn't like a major source of conflict. Or I, I don't know. But what, did, what did you think about the the Greta Gerwig character? Ah, uh, that's it's it, it's I again I think the act, the actress does a great job. It's just getting into that character gets into the racial stuff. Yeah. Well, the interesting thing was, uh, and I, we'll get into this more in a sec. But like I, I remember reading the New Yorker. They were saying like, oh, it's it's kind of lame that like this it's this western character coming to the rescue but at the same time I thought the character was so egregiously annoying and insufferable <laughs> like I almost thought maybe it's kind of maybe like a satire that that sort of like uh, like kind of you know uh, you know a, a white American tourist coming into another country and thinking yeah. they can save it and you think about it she literally does nothing and gets nothing done almost kind of like it it's it, it she is she's more she becomes the voice she does actually no, i know i'd say she's she's played like the voice of the rebellion that's true um, that she's the one true. like who's marshalling all the other students to be like we gotta stand up we gotta talk uh, uh fight against the mayor and and his agenda because right. there's clearly corruption going on and everyone else is just kind of being passive and working at different angles that are not as confrontational. That's true, yeah. And well, and that gets into like one of the uh, the, the, the problems slash strengths, because I think this is a double-edged sword. The, the whole concept of a, a, a essentially no subtitles. Yeah. You know, like, a, like on the one hand, I admire that because that means, you know, we sort of see humans the way the dogs would, like as, you know, because as a, you know, viewers in America, like, well, we, you know, those of us who don't speak Japanese, you know, we, we don't understand what the Japanese characters are saying most of the time, but we understand what the dogs are saying, so we're in their position, like, not understanding humans. Yeah. On the other hand, 
it becomes kind of an awkward thing because we don't understand what the Japanese <laughs> characters are saying. So like, they, they, it kind of like like takes away a certain level of you know agency or eccentricity or personality. It does. It. All right, let's dive into this. Um, okay, let's do it. Yeah. So, a lot of reviews have pointed to this as like as an example of of kind of the a sense of insensitivity and marginalization on the part of, of the storytellers and I can see where they're coming from because it definitely feels like so, uh, Justin Chang wrote the, wrote a review for the LA Times and he described it as uh, it makes the citizens of Megasaki feel like outsiders in their own city Yes, and it's and, and, and on top of that it's the the Japanese that they're speaking is very much don't pared down. It's very simple, short, straightforward sentences that yeah. we can understand through context clues and body language. Uh, and then, on top of that, they have a translator there half the time. They have Francis McDormand's, like, there to, to describe what's happening right, for, like, right. the longer speeches. Which I thought was weird. Like, when you think about that, it doesn't even make sense. Like, like who is she even translating for? You know, it's, it's in Japan. I, is it, like, I, people yeah. who are, like, like, in the U.S. watching Japanese TV? Like, yeah. I get the, I get the idea for that, because there are long stretches of plot where you do need, like, the audience to understand the specifics of what's happening. But also, it, it, it makes, it's like, then why do this at all if half the time it's just translated back into English? Right, right. Um, so, it's, and again, it's, it's this idea of why so few of his stories are set in any specific culture. Yeah. Like, you look at Fantastic Mr. Fox, and it's just, just kind of an accent roulette. It's, it's meant to be, like, American pastoral uh, 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 farmlands, but then all the farmers are voiced by British actors. <laughs> Um, and then like, he wrote a bad song, Peggy. <laughs> <laughs> I will never not laugh at that scene. Oh, that's, um, that scene is ingenious. Yeah. And like all the animals have American accents, and Willem Dafoe as the rat has a Southern accent. Um, so it's it just kind of is whatever, you know. The Grand Budapest Hotel, like we said, it's the same thing. It's accent roulette. Yes. Um, yeah. With this, it's setting it in Japan. It comes across. It's it is racist, but I, at least from from my perspective, it is. Um, but it's not malicious. It, it's sure. it, that's one thing I wanted to uh, I wanted to talk about because it's it's kind of interesting. It's like on the one hand, there's not necessarily bad intent behind it, but on the other hand, yeah. the result is you know. It reminds me most of and bear with me here, Song of the South. Which is sort of Disney's greatest shame, and it's oh, okay. I, I haven't, I haven't seen it, but I'm, yeah. I'm but here, like, here's the truth: like, Song of the South, that movie, there is so little going on that you have no choice but to think about, like, huh? So there's this family that owns a huge mansion in the South, and there's this black guy who just kind of hangs around and is cool with everyone, and it's not even 1900 yet. What's going on here? <laughs> and it's, it's. Because it's rooted in these in the Uncle Remus stories, which right. were they they are a part of Black culture. They're a part of Black culture that's like very much the Uncle Tom idea of like the the this sort of romantic racialism idea of the Black American as docile, church going, uh, subservient to white people, not at all a threat, not at all bitter or upset about slavery or anything just kind of living in harmony mm -hmm. and it's it's not again it's and when Walt Disney made Song of the South it definitely didn't come out of maliciousness it definitely didn't come out of of him saying like these are my thoughts on black culture it came out of he actually liked these stories and they meant a great deal to him and he wanted to bring them to life and there's some to, something to that but there's also not thinking about the implications of what the story you're telling is yes and that's yeah. how I feel about Isle of Dogs it very much comes off like there's a there's a I don't know I don't know how many of you are aware there's a term called a weeaboo which uh, definition is kind of loose but it's a very derogative term for a white person white or just not necessarily American, but just a white person who very much 
fetishizes and obsessive, obsesses over Japanese culture in particular. Mm-hmm. But it's a very specified version of Japanese culture that just comes from anime, Godzilla mo- movies, uh, Kurosawa, and it's reductive and it's it crosses the line into cultural appropriation. That's that's a lot of what I feel Isle of Dogs is. It's trying to pay respect but coming off as as reductive and fetishizing. Well, I want to I want to speak to that because I, I think that's a really good point. And I, I mean, it even I do think what Wes Anderson's doing does dovetail with what you described Disney doing with Song of the South because uh, um, in uh, there's that that little fanfare in Isle of Dogs. Dun, 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 oh, yeah. It's from uh, uh, Kurosawa's Seven Samurai, and the, like the the movie is is kind of paying homage to uh, Kurosawa. I think with the dogs almost being like sort of the the band of samurai who who team up against this uh, this threat, you know. And so there's I, I definitely see you know affection for Kurosawa in there. But then on the other hand. I, I think what you're saying, you know, about like kind of fetishizing this, you know, very this sort of narrow conception of Japanese culture is true. And I, I see that especially in the movie, like kind of like, well, of course, you know, the mayor, you know, there's a scene where he watches sumo wrestlers. You know, of course, <laughs> when someone gets poisoned, they get poisoned with sushi. With wasabi. It, yeah, yeah, with wasabi. You know, you, it's like a. And, and you, 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 it's like they take a collection of and like a kind of like all the things like Americans know about Japan, like all the kind of like like obvious things. Yeah, and it's uh, the parts I mean, that it, make it across the sh- across the Pacific. Yeah, it is. Uh, it is reductive. It does feel like appropriation. Yeah. So I, I still like the movie, but that's it's that's that's a thing that that should be considered that should sure, be taken yeah, into course, account yeah. well, this, this is why we do film criticism is that we engage with the with the text we, we do we look we at do. it yeah yeah and people you know it makes people mad when we you know do our job but we do it nonetheless <laughs> you say job like we get paid for this <laughs> it's I mean you do Mr. Fancy Pants <laughs> but I want to I want to go uh, go a little deeper into all this because uh you know, uh, kind of like what, another thing, and it's, it's in a way this is the opposite, but in a way it's not. Another thing Wes Anderson gets criticized for is he, he's been criticized for you know mostly like uh, you know making films about these these white characters and yeah. you know pretty pretty much for the most part exclusively white male characters, yeah. not not you know solely but almost entirely, and uh, it's kind of interesting. Now he, he tries to like he's trying to engage with another culture, and he's running into trouble there too. Both in terms of how you know people are reacting and what I would argue are you know objectively very serious problems with what he's done. Yeah. I, I mean, it raises the question like, you know, is it is it better to try and and fail, or is it you know? Should he kind of just stick to what he knows, or or should or should he? I mean, or is the problem that it's like, well, he doesn't engage with another culture until it's an animated film, and he, you know, isn't you know actually showing any actual Japanese actors on the screen? Right? Yeah. Well, the, well, for starters, I well speaking to the last part, he does cast ja- again cast Japanese actors to voice those characters and right. actually the, Ken Watanabe and Yoko Ono yeah and, and the guy who uh, who voices Mayor Kobayashi he actually helped with the story and oh, he was really? yeah he was there with it was Wes Anderson Jason Schwartzman him and, and someone else who I'm, I'm not remembering but uh, okay oh, I, oh yeah because yeah I'm, now I remember story by and, yeah. yeah so speaking to this I, this gets into the and a whole other issue of representation um because there is this question like if should someone who's outside a specific group write stories for them you know should we have uh should we have a white person writing a story about a black person or a japanese person or anything right right um and it's it's 
there is there's not a clear answer because this is called this is what the problem with cultural appropriation it's there's no line sure it's all so much of it is subjective um, the you know something we were talking about other movies we'd seen earlier recently uh, you talked about love Simon yes that's based on a book written by a straight woman right and does that disqualify does that lessen the story um, and the response from from what I've heard from a lot of, of writers there's the response has been no it doesn't because it's it does speak to a certain truth and it does it doesn't marginalize the it, it doesn't marginalize these people uh, these groups it doesn't uh, uh, lessen their experience um, and another another one I'm gonna another example I'm gonna bring up one of my favorite comics going on right now is Bitch Planet um, which Kelly is Sudeconics. Kelly Sudeconics right? and Valentine Delandro's series uh, which is an angry feminist take on the women in prison exploitation movies and it's something where Kelly Sue DeConnick is who is very aware of this. Uh, she's like, so I am a white woman, and these are st I'm telling stories about black people, about trans people, about queer people, and she's admits she's not a part of these groups, but she talks to people in these groups. She makes sure she gets the story right. You know, there was there's been this huge delay in issues uh, because. She wanted to rework and rework and rework the script that introduces trans characters into the story because she wanted to get it right. Um, so it speaks to I think I think what it comes down to is just sensitivity, understanding, um, very much getting your subject matter, uh, and that's where it seems like Wes Anderson stumbled. Was uh, again, it's a, it's it's a narrow view of Japanese culture. Um, yeah. It's it's not again. I, I, it never feels malicious. It's just unintentionally problematic. And I know that word gets used a lot, but that's it, that's the best way I can describe it. Is it's problematic. I really I really like what you said about the idea of like there's there's not a clear cut answer. You yeah. know, because I mean I mean you can even look at the the same you know artist you know, trying to, you know, kind of, you know, look through like, the eyes of characters different from them and, and yeah. getting it right in one instance and getting it wrong in another. Like, I was I was just thinking about, uh, you know, uh, Sofia Coppola just now, who, of course, is, you know, connected to Wes Anderson via Roman Coppola. And, that you know, was the last one, Roman Coppola. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, like, like, I think um, uh, Sofia Coppola's male characters are absolutely extraordinary. Like, like she, uh, I think, I think she really gets the way men think, and you know the way men, or, or at least certain men, react in certain situations, and uh, and and I think that's really extraordinary. You know, she, you know, through, you know, either empathy or, or instinct or just pure intelligence, you know, she can she can create these great male characters. But then you know, on the beguiled, she ran into trouble because you know oh, yeah. the one. Uh, a slave character in, in the book she uh, she cuts out because she didn't you know want to deal with that and like that kind of like ability to like like empathize with you know someone different than herself you know well that she didn't like you know she didn't reach for that there you know so I mean there's a certain sense in which everyone I, I think is fallible really yeah it's I, I I, I don't. I don't have a clear cut answer for this. It's just. It's a really loaded topic. Yeah, that absolutely. I don't know how 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 deep I can get into the subject and and come out looking, come out being intelligent or being right. Um, you always come out intelligent in my book. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Um, but it, it's. It, I'm 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 repeating myself at that point. It's. For, let's see. Um, I'm, I'm trying to compose my thoughts here. Uh, I would, I would like to see, I would like to see more of Wes Anderson kind of branching out. Because sure, sure. When there, there was this whole thing on our tour theory, and the idea is like, uh, I think Pauline Kael 
came up with this phrase that I'm, I'm paraphrasing because I don't remember the exact words, but it's something along the lines of repetition without innovation is stagnation. You know, we like to we like to praise auteurs because we, as as film goers, we can see the patterns in their work. But if they're not building on themselves, if they're not trying new things, then where it feels inadequate, it feels like they're just you know repeating themselves. They're running in circles. Well, the um, best auteurs, you know, they they have a voice that you always recognize, but at the same time, they're always moving forward. They're using that voice in different ways. Yeah. You know? So. I like the parts of this, the, so there's parts of this movie where it does stray from Wes Anderson's style because he doesn't use stop motion animation a lot, he doesn't do something that feels very much for kids a lot, and he, he, def, he, doesn't, he doesn't create worlds like this where it's so deliberately messy and chaotic and just yeah. not necessarily dead but, but dying. Um, it's a bit. It's a bit like looser too. Like, and, and I mean, that's. I think that's part of the the problem. But at the same time, I think it, it represents like at least an attempted attempt to grow. Like not having that kind of like snappy, you know, yeah. screwball energy of the past few films. Right? Yeah, it's it's definitely slower and more ponderous. So yeah, yeah. I would like to see him. Which see is actually another thing that's. That, Kind of like Seven Samurai, really, which is a, a kind of a leisurely film. Definitely. So I would like to see him grow, and I would like to see him experiment and do different things. Because for all his flaws, he's entertaining as hell. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, that's 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 my thoughts on the matter. Um, I I do do you want do you want to uh, talk about any more of the movies we did? Seem like sure. I, I don't think I have any more. Uh, yeah, I got Do- doggy thoughts. <laughs> um, final notes. Um, it's final good. Notes, yes. It's flawed. I'd recommend seeing it and judging for yourself. Yeah, you know, I, I would say um, uh, it's a. Uh, I mean, a new Wes Anderson movie always worth checking out. You know, yeah. I mean, he's a. Uh, he is a. Uh, he, he is a true original, and like like even his even his weakest films, I think, are always uh, a lot of fun. This this one to me, I think, is. Uh, I, I'm still a little bit baffled by it. Like it's it's very I, I I'm still like like even though we kind of got into this, I'm still not sure. Like I don't know what he was getting at. Like I almost <laughs> feel a little bit like he just went like, you know, I've got these ideas. I'm gonna throw them on the screen. It's like very this. it's very much just throwing a lot of things at the wall to see what sticks. Yeah, yeah. Like like I would say like you know like we we talked about you know you talked about you know he doesn't do a lot of stuff for kids like you know. Even though Fantastic Mr. Fox is very edgy and sophisticated, like, like if if I had kids, I would not hesitate to let them watch that movie. Whereas, like, I feel like, like if I had kids, like they might be a little bored by parts of Iowa Dogs, <laughs> you know, to be perfectly honest. And to be honest, I, yeah. there are parts where I was a little bored, but you know, I mean, yeah. yeah. Um, what uh, should we talk uh, a little bit about uh, Ready Player One? Yeah, Since sure. Saw that. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm coming as someone who read the book. Uh, I I thought it was fine. I had fun. Um, it's better than the book. But I, I I'm I'm not of the opinion that uh, there's been a lot of backlash to the book, and I can see why. Um, I'm not of the opinion that it's like one of the worst things to happen to geek culture ever. Um, it's just it's it's the it's mostly harmless. Um, there's better it's anonymous D- Douglas Adams yeah. smiling somewhere. Yeah, there's there's better treaties on on treatises on nerd culture, um, on media consumption, on nostalgia, and and the the lights and darks of that. Excuse me. So seeing the movie that it the movie very much changes a lot of the book. It basically just takes the core idea and character names. And everything else just kind of flips the switches on. Some of that is by necessity because they couldn't get the rights to a lot of it, yeah. um, and some of it is just better, just for the sake of telling a story. Like one, one of the challenges in the book is to recre- recreate the entirety of Monty Python and the Holy Grail, <laughs> and 
in the book, it's because they don't go into specifics. It's it's treated as just kind of this fun exercise. I, I honestly really like that moment in the book because it it feels true to what Ernest Cline was getting at. You know, mm-hmm. it's it, just it's good to make friends. Sure. Because uh, that's very much a group activity. And if you see it on screen, you know, you don't need to see any more nerds quoting Monty Python and the Holy Grail. That, that's been done to death. That's a mark of obnoxiousness by now. So changing that around, uh, that worked for me. Um, I, I had fun. I liked the references. I liked uh, most of the performances. Um, it, it was fine. I want to get into the story a little bit because one thing that I think we're gonna let's do spoilers just because it makes it easier. Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, One real problem I had was I mean I I feel like with a movie like this, with a big fantasy like this, uh, you know, it's great if you can stage uh, you know a big action sequence in an exciting and coherent way, which is a a very rare skill these days and Spielberg does that very well here you know the the action I think is the strongest part of the movie yeah but at the same time it's like there's gonna be a certain hollowness I feel if you really don't care like whether or not the main character lives or dies you know <laughs> if you don't like like you can have it doesn't matter like how beautifully choreographed all the mayhem is because it's like like if you don't like feel that this person needs to try and you aren't really rooting for him they're there's a, a, ga- a gap there, and, and I felt like it was like, like I was I like Ty Sheridan. He's a he's a very like charismatic guy, but he's at the fine. same time, you know, uh, the efforts to like give him any sort of depth like fell so flat. Like, oh, he's got a, a dead aunt and a horrible dead step uncle, and yeah. it's like you know, oh, he. Uh, he wants to save, you know, a, a love interest who is given no personality yeah, whatsoever. They, so you really you, you feel person. no connection between them. I mean, it's like, like as as much as I admired the technique and like, you know, I I grooved to like, you know, that uh, that car race through like, you know, that like neon green like underground matrix. You yeah. know, like at the same time, I was just like, you know, man, like like on the one hand, like you know, we were talking about. Black Panther and, and some of the action there is like a little like maybe could have been more coherent but I didn't really care because I was so invested in the story and the characters you know yeah. and Ready Player One was the exact opposite you know great action but it's like well I didn't really care what happened to these people <laughs> so why I don't know the you know hum- yeah the human stories are always the weakest parts of both the book and the movie it's it's the idea is like Wade Watts is supposed to be you know this blank slate every man that like we project ourselves onto and like he's into all this fanboy stuff well you're into all this fanboy stuff reader (laughs) so you should like him too but it's like but like in the book he's also a lot of the toxicity of fandom just like gatekeeping and 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 smug (laughs) self-righteousness and regressive sexism and then the movie they strip a lot of that out which is good but then he kind of doesn't have anything to latch onto he's just there well, it might have been better if they, you know, like, engaged with that a bit and, like, like had the character be a little toxic and questioned that, you know? It's, like, they, there's the hint of that. Like, the idea, his, this, this is his arc in the movie, is that he wants to get the fortune, get Halliday's fortune just so that he can, you know, live it up and be rich. Right. Instead of using it to help people. And that's his arc, is learning, like, oh, you've got you've to live for the community and you've got to... You, we're all in this together. You know, you gotta, you gotta help people. You know, with great power comes great responsibility. Where's the live by? Yeah. So there's that, but it, 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 it it's very, it, it feels very weak. Um, the side characters are definitely more interesting. Just, be, just like the. Well, little... I would have rather have followed uh, Olivia Cook's character through the whole thing. Yeah. Because she's actually leading this revolution. As opposed to, you know, following this, this kid who's basically, you know, a nobody, mm-hmm. and not like in an interesting way where, like, he's a nobody who has to define himself. No, he truly is nobody. He's there just, is nothing interesting about him. He is just a guy who, like, who stu- literally stumbled onto the first clue by yeah. accident. Yeah. Not necessarily, not even by accident, just, like, he made a bunch of really ridiculous leaps to find the first clue, 
and then he was right. Right, right. And here we are. Um, I, I was also really bothered by, and, and I kind of suspected I would be watching the trailers, and I was I was not wrong based on the movie. I was a little troubled by like how the film dealt with the idea of virtual reality. Because one thing I like about you know, you know, films like you know The Matrix or Inception is that there's a really nuanced look at the idea of the virtual and the idea of you know like well you can do these uh, these wondrous things you know you can have these wondrous experiences and those are a part of you those do define you to a certain extent but you know kind of what those movies get at is like you know well you know eventually you do have to wake up uh-huh. and it's like Ready Player One say, says the same thing but so half it doesn't commit like it's, to it yeah it's almost like Spielberg was just like well I know reality's good, so I just gotta like you know pay a little lip service. But that's, to, you know, that's definitely guys. the book. That's definitely the book. Is that, that comes from from Klein? You think? Yeah, it's 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 the, Klein's argument is that like the world is screwed, but it's worth saving, and there's something to. But the, what world? I, you know, I mean, that's the. There's question. definitely something to that, but it's it's like you know, if the entire world revolves around the oasis, like this economic powerhouse like I, it feels more in line with the matrix because the matrix is, is like you want to wake up to what to right. underground 90s club raves and <laughs> a sky that is literally blacked out <laughs> like why why would you want to wake up um there's I get the ideology of it I get like not wanting to be a living battery yes but at yeah. the same time why would you want to live in that world <laughs> And Ready Player One falls very much falls into the same trap. Sure, um, sure. There's also, you know, the lack of depth of, like... The idea is that these people, they create these avatars that are kind of some form of self-expression. They never explain, like, what it is, you know? Yeah. Like, it, it says something that, that Wade's, like, per- avatar is just a guy. He's just some anime dude. <laughs> you know, he, he's got big eyes and weird cheeks, and he dresses like Buckaroo Banzai, and that's it. Right. <laughs> It's, it, it, it's like with, with, with age at least, it makes sense. Like, her whole thing is that she's posing as a dude online. So, yeah. her avatar is the most aggressively hyper masculine thing there is. Sure. It's like sure. this giant cyborg orc guy. And then, you know, you peel back the layers. I love the bit where it's like, I don't like scary movies, man. Yeah, that, yeah. I yeah. love that part. And it's because I related to that. I, also I, I related like to that too. Movies. Yeah, I was like, oh man, if I was trapped in The Shining, like, <laughs> no, no. I, yeah. H hold up, hold up, hold up better than I would do that, let me yeah. tell you. <laughs> so it's it, stuff like that. And then, like, you look at, uh, you look at Sorrento's avatar and it's just, you know, a guy. Yeah. It's just like this kind of beefy dude in a suit. Yeah, yeah, and like, like, why would he have a, a suit? In, I mean, it's like <laughs> because he has a suit in sense. real life. Like the, his his whole, I, I, his character. But like, wouldn't kinda, you want like like armor if you're in the Oasis? Like, like I get the sense that the Oasis is like is like kind of like how they how they set up games nowadays is that. You can have av- like whatever armor you want, but you can still custom design your character. Sure. So like you can have like plus ten armor and still look like you're wearing a magic cape or whatever. So I imagine that's how what his avatar is, is that he did buy all the best armor and all the best gear. Sure. But he dresses him like a, a guy in a suit because he is a guy in a suit and that's right. all he wants to be. Sure. Sure. Um, I can buy that, yeah. Yeah. So it's and then at the end he pulls out Mega Godzilla anyway and it doesn't speak to anything. It's just like, oh, he had Mega Godzilla. In the book it's because like there was a prize where you can get a giant robot and he obviously picks the villain giant robot. Of course, yeah. Um so it, it yeah, I that part felt that part felt it fell short. Yeah, yeah. I absolutely agree. And also like uh, I, I know they stripped out like a lot of the creepiness of Wade, but there's still that moment where he sees that he meets Artemis or Samantha in real life, and see, he sees she has the birthmark, and oh, he's like, yeah. I still think you're pretty, and it's like, that's super skeezy, man. Well, you, I, I mean, I think the, the problem is... I get, I get what they're going for, but that's one of those skeezy, like, you look pretty without makeup kind of <laughs> like thing that really gross dude bros do. Well, the, and the issue is, like, I don't... I mean... Like, to be honest, if they had any guts, like, they would have had her be, like, severely disfigured or something, you know, and have, like, 
like him, you know, still think she's pretty then, you know, because it's like, like oh she's, she's got like what looks like a, a splotch of you know, makeup yeah. on the and side of her face. Definitely you know? described as worse in the book. So it's like I mean, and there you go. If they're like toning it down even from that, like you know, like why not you know, again like you know make it a, a real story about like transcending you know the illusions of the the avatars and you know he have her truly love her for who she is but like no they're gonna they're gonna make it easy and like you know like oh it's just something she can like you know cover you know with her hair you know yeah. just, and then and then she has the birth she puts the birthmark on her avatar and it's supposed to be some statement it's like no no uh, yeah that was oh uh, it's yeah it's fine it's mostly harmless yeah. I yeah I, I, I enjoyed it you know and I and I don't I don't want to be disingenuous like because I had a good time with the movie but at the same time it's like it's, there was the sense of like, some, like being had it's pretty know, indes- like, indefensible at yeah, points yeah exactly yeah yeah so that was one I saw recently um we've had we've had two like surprisingly good comedies this year we've had Game Night and Blockers I saw neither one okay Blockers should not be it, it had terrible marketing like it's just like the for those of you who don't know the premise, the idea is that three, like, suburban parents find out that their teenage daughters are go- are going to lose their virginity on prom night. Mm. And they run out to put a stop to it. And on its surface, that's a really gross, dumb idea. <laughs> and it's treated as a comedy. And then the movie goes and it's like, no, this really is a gross, dumb idea. And we're aware of that. And that's part of the point of it, is that this is gross and dumb and they're in the wrong. <laughs> Um, so it's weirdly progressive in that way. Um, really great performances, especially from the three parents. Uh, I don't know why John Cena decided to go into comedy, but it works for him because he works as just like this parody of American masculinity. Um, Leslie Mann and Ike Barinholtz have been great forever, so they they do great. Uh, the kids are fine. It all works. It's it's kind of unambitious but it works also you do get to see Gary Cole's dick in that movie so <laughs> if that's your thing man go for it so and the uh, and game night game I, night I heard, I heard the good reviews I confess I skipped it because I was so underwhelmed by the trailer which I know is a bad reason to skip something but, nah, but it was but it was good it was like it's I there's no secret like this is one of those movies where it's like what's the alchemical recipe why is this different it's it's a solid script. It's good direction. It's a great cast. Nice. That's it. Like they 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 shoot it. They shoot parts of it like it's an action movie or like it's a horror movie. There's one there's one bit in the middle where they have to like steal a Fabergé egg from <laughs> someone, and it's and it's like they they're trying to escape his house, and he's got all these all these people after them, and they're you know it's a game of hot potato with the egg, <laughs> and it's all done in one take. And that's, it's like that sounds pretty cool. a minute long, and it works. Um, it's just, it's funny. It's a, it's. I really wish I could go into deep into some deep it with it, but it's just like no. It's these are good people. It's a solid script. They're good directors. Uh, Jason Bateman and Rachel McAdams are fucking terrific. It's I love both of them. Yeah. So, I, when was the last time Rachel McAdams did comedy? Because the last time I remember was Mean Girls. Oh that was man! I mean, I don't know. I mean, like, I mean, well, what, well, Wedding Crashers oh, was yeah. the year after. Uh, oh yeah, Mean Girls. Yeah. I just I remember like she transitioned into drama so naturally that I just, that like oh yeah she was in I just remember her as being nominated for Spotlight. Right. Right. And yeah. Now, and now it's like oh yeah she can do comedy too and she's still really good at it. She's I just I think she's hands down one of the greatest actors for today. I mean, yeah. I was just some, uh, re-watching uh, Re- uh, Wes Craven's Red Eye the other day. Oh, oh, she was in that, wasn't she? Yeah. Have you have you seen that? I, I've seen a review of it. I know, like, the bits and pieces of it. That movie is genius. I mean, it is just... I mean, the... And, and, I, and I don't mean this in, the romantic, in a romantic way, but the chemistry that she and Killian Murphy have and uh, the way that she turns the tables on him at the end, I mean, it's just... It's just some of just the the greatest, like most gripping suspense in any movie I think of of the twenty first century. So far, honestly, yeah, it's uh, it's dynamite. It's awesome. What, uh, what else have you seen recently? Uh, 
a lot of things. Um, uh, I was thinking. Uh, I, I was. I was thinking. Uh, I've got four uh, favorite movies of this year mm-hmm. so far. Um, uh, Annihilation, okay. Black Panther, Love Simon, and Paddington Two. Some of them I've talked about already. Uh, uh, Annihilation. Uh, in, in retrospect, I, I think I may have overrated it a bit after I first saw. It. I, I think some of it's like. Some of it's a little pretentious, to be honest, you know. But it's a, it's a great kind of surreal, uh, you know, metaphorically speaking, acid trip ride. Like you know, you, like kind of like you know, it's because like, it's Alex Garland's second film after he did Ex Machina. You know, mm-hmm. Ex Machina, like I, I really liked it, but it's a very like tidy, you know, little story about you know, someday you know if we play with technology too much. It will eclipse us, you know. <laughs> like it's it's a very tidy moral, and annihilation is a uh, it's big and, and messy, and you, you get to the end, and it's just this wild, like just totally batshit cosmic journey, kind of like two thousand one, but it, it it has a different flavor, you know. There's there's some alien, you know, craziness, you know, or is it alien craziness? Dun, you dun, don't dun, know, dun. you know. I mean, yes. so I haven't seen funny. annihilation. I don't know if I'm gonna because I again I don't like scary movies. It's a uh, I know some people. of it, some of it's scary, but I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's like, like true horror. You know, it's really, it's. I'd say it's really more like, like just kind of surrealist, like hard sci-fi, like with, with a couple scary monsters thrown in. You know, there's a scary bear that you know, that dead people's voices talk out of, and an albino <laughs> crocodile that eats people. You know? So, right on. So some of that, some of that stuff's a little nasty. You know? And then there's a thing with Oscar Isaac, you know, doing some really boring crap <laughs> that I don't even want to describe because right. it's not much. But um, uh, oh yeah, and also uh, uh did, did did you see Paddington too? I I saw pieces of it and I I wanted to see it, but I have not seen the first one. Do you I, don't need to see the first one? I I, I hadn't seen the first. I one absolutely either. believe that because I I not to be a dick, but I don't suspect I would get a lot of like plot complexity. From, from the Paddington movies, well, look, but, but it looks. What I saw looks just very charming, very delightful. I, ju- I just I do. We had at at the at Fox Tower, and I was doing theater checks. I watched uh, a scene where hit of him making marmalade with uh, that's so with Brendan great. Gleeson. So great. I I love Brendan Gleeson. I love that dude so much. Well, well let, uh, and I think this is going to sell you. Brendan Gleeson's character is named Knuckles McGinty. And if that's not reason I to see him. a movie, I do not know what it is. I love him. I want to protect him. <laughs> oh, he's oh that that, that that man is a treasure. Oh, so yeah, yeah. I, I'll I'll probably catch it at some point. Um, it's not at the theater anymore. Uh, right now, we we have three screens playing Isle of Dogs at the Fox Tower. <laughs> oh, I'm I'm not surprised. <laughs> um, yeah. So, um, did you see I Kill Giants? No. No, that came out already. That came out. That that's like on demand. It's like in theaters, in select it? cities. But um, okay, so here's here's the story. Uh, Eichel Giants is based on a graphic novel uh, written by Joe Kelly, art by Ken Nomura, um, published by Image in 2009. It's it, it is my favorite graphic novel of all time. Really, it's, really, I did not know that. So like a, a lot a, again, like a lot of my favorite stuff has to do with timing. Um, so this is, you know, it's a time when I first started really getting into comics. Um, I, I started listening to the Iron Fanboy comic book podcast. They talked about it. They praised it. I was like, I gotta check this out myself. I bought it. I loved it. Um, it's it's a really great story. Uh, and adapting it, so I was very nervous about seeing it get adapted. Um, I think this is, it's very much like a straight one-to-one adaptation because... Joe Kelly wrote the script. He wrote the comic and he wrote the screenplay. Okay. And one of the conditions of him like selling the screenplay was like he can't make any changes to it. Um, there's a few subtle differences between the the book and the movie. Some of them are for the better. Some of them I think kind of feel like stumbling blocks. Um, but it's it's a really is a one to one adaptation. And did, the, did you like the movie? I I liked the movie. It's it did not affect me the same way I think it would a first time viewer because it's like oh these are the same story beats so I know what's going to happen. Okay. Um, is it animated? Or? It's live action. Okay. Uh, it's who's the cast? Uh, Madison Wolf uh, plays our lead. She's 
phenomenal. She does such a great job. Um, Zoe Saldana, uh, Imogen Poots. Uh, I forget the name of the girl who plays Sophia. Um, uh, it's directed by Anders Walter. This is his feature debut, but he did win an Oscar for like best short feature a few years back. Um, it's a little slow going at first because there's okay. not like really a lot of forward momentum. It's it's very much about exploring this one situation of this girl who she is uh, she's kind of alienated from the rest of her peers. She's smarter than any 11 year old should be. Um, she's super into fantasy stuff and she tells people that she kills giants in her free time and she like protects the town from giants and it's sort of exploring you know why does she believe that uh, is she are the giants real or are they not um, what do other people think of that what does what is her family like like family uh, home life like uh, stuff like that and it's it's really, it is interesting, and it's about these bigger ideas of coping with loss and coping with death and coping with these things through the eyes of a child. And it's, they, they keep enough of it that I did almost cry at the end because it's, it's, the coda to that movie is so beautiful. And they actually improved, like, one of the major beats of the story at the end that I think was, works so much better. Um... So I'm gonna, I give that high recommendation. Go see it. Nice. Um, it's on streaming on, on Amazon and on iTunes. It's playing in select cities, but Portland is not one of them, so I, so I don't know which ones. Uh, well, it, it sounds miles better from what happened. Well, my favorite graphic novel of all time was adapted because that ended with uh, Zack Snyder's Watchmen. <laughs> Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Thank you. No, but that um uh, that, that sounds that sounds great. I, I knew uh, I knew nothing about either the the movie or the the graphic novel, but and that sounds like a really beautiful story. It's it's worth checking out. Um, and that pretty much brings us up. I, I watched The Death of Stalin. My review of that's on the website. Yes, go to the website. <laughs> go to the website, which is thlmoviereviews.wordpress.com. Not Blogspot. Not Blogspot. We don't do that no more. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's, oh. that's where we are. I want to give a shout out to just a couple more movies. Oh, go for it. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, so, uh... This is, this is our, I guess this is our, like, mid-year roundup now. Yeah, I guess so, yeah, it's kind of like, it just mutated into that, like, of a, gradually. It worked, works for me. Yeah. Um, uh, we were talking about Love, Simon earlier. Love, Simon is, uh, beautiful. Might even be my favorite movie of this year so far. I mean, it's just, uh... There, it's just the the compassion that you feel the actors have for the characters, and the uh, Rick Berlanti who directed it has for those characters. I mean, it's it's really something to see. You know, it's uh, it's inspirational and heartwarming, but you know, it's that rare movie that is heartwarming in like a genuine way. Like you don't feel like you're being worked. Like like the, I I teared up at that. <laughs> I mean, there there was a scene uh, when. Uh, uh, just a, a father's son scene in that movie it's just one of the most heartbreaking yet beautiful father's son scenes I've ever seen in a movie it's uh, it's pretty great and uh, it's it's doing pretty well box office wise so I'm uh, I'm very, very I'm happy for it and uh, the the other movie I want to give out a shout out to this is a, a couple months old but uh, I, I saw it again recently and I had a kind of a, a revelation about it um, uh, uh, back when it came out in December I saw uh, the the greatest show mm-hmm. and uh, I uh, I I had some issues with it but uh, I, I enjoyed it to, to be perfectly honest but I was you know it was not cool to like it at all so I, I kind <laughs> of uh, to, to be honest like I, I kind of didn't lean too hard into the things I liked and I mostly focused on like you know like well it's kind of you know lame how you know they, they don't do anything about the animals being abused you know and, yeah but um, uh, I uh, I saw I, I went with my sister to see that movie, uh, in, The Empirical, at Alms recently, and I gotta say, I uh, I was I was really wrong. I think I had a I had a hell of a time. I mean, it's so uh, I and I and I think a lot of critics got it wrong. To be honest, like yes, it's sappy. Yes, it's you know ludicrous and gigantic, and it you know it certainly has some issues. But I. Uh, 
I, I wanted to sing and dance <laughs> after I came out of the empirical that day. So I was, uh, I, I, I'm issuing a little bit of a, a mea culpa. I'm, I was, I'm sorry for, you know, you know, acting like I was too good for the greatest show. At least, at least for me, I, I retroactively put it on my list of the best of 2017. So I, I, for me, like the big issue with it is that like the central core of the movie, the, the idea they're trying to sell is uh, P.T. Barnum as champion of the, of the marginalized and, and of the... the but, 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 but the, it, the movie actually, it, it ends up really... Like, like the, the central conflict is really that, you know, he brings all these people in, he brings all these marginalized people and you know, gives them, you know, a, a place to be themselves. But then, you know, like as soon as he's successful, he turns away from them. And he's like, you know, uh, like trying to become like an opera guy, like kind of catering to the stuffed shirts. And like, it, it just, it shows like how he gets caught up in hubris and like, you know, how there is but it, an element of bigotry in that. And like the, the, the core of the movie is how he realizes, hey, I, I was wrong. You know, I, I lost sight of, you know, the people who really matter. But so, but that just feels such bullshit. But like, I, I, I he, like it. But you got it. It feels the, so much of it is just like oh he he gave he gave a, a platform to, to to people who had to a, a, a dwarf to a, a bearded woman to a guy with tattoos to a guy who was tall. But it's here's like, the thing. Here's the thing. He exploited people with birth defects. But here's the thing. Have you seen the movie? I have. The movie okay okay but but you you got to know then that the movie has no illusions about why he did it. The movie like fully admits that he just wanted to make a buck. You know, it, like yeah, but the, the movie, the movie makes that clear. It, it's but so much of it feels like it's it's making a state, uh, the statement of like who he was and who this what this guy believed in. It's like no. I don't I don't think he did believe in that. I think they, they it's the story of a guy who kind of almost stumbles into it because he thinks it's a good gimmick, and then I think yeah, after he's done it, it's like it's like sort of retroactively he's like oh, you know maybe there was some maybe there was something there, but like I don't think it's like I, trying to say. He's special, or he's a hero. I mean, you it, know, it, he's an arrogant guy, you know, driven by you know showmanship and greed, who has has a lot to apologize for at the end. I know? yeah, it's I, I didn't feel that from the movie. I feel I felt like they were trying to frame him as a hero who just temporarily lost his way in the middle of the movie because he needed an arc. It's I, I think it, they did really good music videos. Yeah, yeah, I, I absolutely. think Hugh yeah. Jackman is a great performer. Yeah, yeah, um, no question. But that's that's really all it has going for it for me. I don't know. I just I, it really, it really, it really got me. It really got me. Like I, I, I don't know. Like I'm like that kind of like sappy, sentimental stuff. Like when it's it's done with enough panache, like it <laughs> it works on me. You know, like and and I just I think uh, like it, it, it like the the songs. And like the the dance sequences, like they were, they have a little bit of that like kind of music video vibe without going like full tilt into like the Bosler and like Sugar High, <laughs> you know, where you just you feel like you're like you just like shoved like twelve boxes of red vines down your throat, <laughs> you know. Like I thought it, it wasn't it obviously doesn't like approach to like you know like old movies where you get like great like long takes. You know, but, yeah. But yeah. So I I don't know I. I, I'm, I'm siding with a lot of the credits there. I didn't think it was that great. <laughs> well, so. let's let, let's uh, before we wrap up. Okay. Since you said, as you know, this is like kind of become our mid-year thing. Yes. Um. Uh, do uh, it, well. What, what's what's your favorite? Uh, what, what are you most looking forward to that's coming up next, either in summer or even in uh, even in fall? Most, if you want to go down let's that. Let's see. Most road. looking forward to. Um. I have. I, let's see. I mean, obviously, Infinity War. I mean, just what I what the hell is going to happen there? I don't know, but I want to find out. Um, I have honestly, this is the one that kind of fascinates me. Is by its existence, is Mary Poppins Returns. Really, <laughs> like, really. I the entire existence of this movie is predicated on P.L. Travers is dead, and she can't stop us from using the rights to this character anymore. Right. Um, but I I love Mary Poppins. I love that movie. I know she did the she did not like that movie, but it's like eh, there's something to be said about adaptation. We just talked no, about I mean, Ready it's... Ready Player One. They have an entire beat on like yeah, uh, Stephen uh, Stanley Kubrick's The Shining 
is an icon of horror, but Stephen King hated it. Sure, sure. Um, so there's something to be said about change and adaptation, and honestly, like... Well, a good adaptation, like, has to... It has to be its own thing. Because yeah. otherwise, you know, well, you can just you can just read the source material. You exactly. Know? It's like, it doesn't mean anything if it's not, you know, bringing, you know, something new to the table. So, like, we're, what, five decades out from the original Mary Poppins. Yeah. We've got... We've got we've got Lin Manuel Miranda playing the only Puerto Rican in London. Right. right. Um, I I want to see what happens. I want to see what they do with that. And I'm all, I'm also interested. They've got a Christopher Robin movie. Right. Right. And that's a weird ass trailer, but I love how weird it is. You know, I was I was not looking forward to that at all, and then I saw that weird ass trailer. <laughs> <laughs> Once I saw that, I was like, like okay, you you've got my attention. If nothing else, because you pulled the bait and switch up. I thought this was some, like, gloomy, like, indie movie starring Ewan McGregor, some depressed corporate guy, and then, like, what this is about Winnie the Pooh? And this what is, the here's hell? semi-realistic Pooh Bear, yeah. voiced by Jim Cummings still. <laughs> um, that was pretty great, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know what else. Like, I, it's, I, all my answers are Disney stuff, like Wreck-It Ralph 2. I want to see where they go with that. Um... I, I don't. I don't know. I don't know what else is coming out, man. Well, I've got one. Uh, Go for it. This isn't my most anticipated of the year, but uh, it's it's my most anticipated movie that's coming out soon. Uh, totally. Oh I'm really? Yeah. I'm really pumped to see uh, Charlize Theron and Jason Reitman and Diablo Cody back together because I think uh, Young Adult was one of the, the best movies he ever directed. And absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And like, that's another one. The, the trailer is very odd. You can't tell like what kind of movie it's gonna be, and I like that. I you know? it's, I love the teaser because it. Yeah. I, I think it's just I love it because Charlie Theron is so goddamn. Good. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, sorry to bother you. What's a, what's that? Okay, so this is um, it's like s- weird surrealism stuff. Uh, Boots Riley directed it. He's like a, a, a rapper, I think. And this oh is yeah. His feature debut. Um, and Lakeith Stanfield stars. I love that dude. I love him so much. Oh, um, he's great. yeah. But the idea is that he's a uh, he's like this down on his luck guy who gets a job as a telemarketer and he starts getting success because he starts speaking to people in a white voice which is Oh, I he, heard about he's this. He's talking yeah, but yeah. like his he's suddenly voiced by David Cross <laughs> and he starts moving up the corporate ladder wow. and then weird stuff starts happening and like he's in it uh, 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 Tessa Thompson, uh, Terry Crews, Army Hammer. Uh, uh, this is an insane cast. Like, it, I, I want to. This looks so weird, but so different and interesting. I want to see what happens. Yeah, I, that's. that's a, I mean, just that that concept. Like, <laughs> like just sitting here and thinking, like, wow. There's so much you can do with that. Like, like there's so much potential for like comedy and commentary. Yeah. Honestly, like that. It just looks too weird to ignore, so yeah. I'm I'm interested in that one. Oh, that sounds that sounds really interesting. Yeah. Um let's see, I don't know I don't know if it's even gonna come out this year, but I I because it's technically scheduled for January, but I, I think they might do like an Oscar, you know, Oscar qualifying Bush. screening. Um uh, uh, Ad Astra with uh, Brad Pitt Pitt. It's uh, Basically, going to be like Apocalypse Now in space. You know, he's uh, he's going off into the unknown, uh, looking for Tommy Lee Jones. Uh, James Gray directed it. He did The Lost City of Zed, uh, one of my favorite movies of last year. He also did uh, Two Lovers, one of my favorite movies of all time. Uh, I uh, Zed really showed him like being able to expand from character drama to telling stuff on an epic scale. So I'm I'm excited to see him go into outer space. And he's got Hoyt Van Hoytema who shot uh, Interstellar. So, I mean, okay. if there's anyone I trust so to look nice. shoot space, you know, it's, you know, the guy who, you know, shot in space. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I'm, cu- I'm vaguely curious about Solo. I'm, I, I'm curious, but mostly just morbidly. You I know? just, I... <laughs> I'm amused by the fact that they're going to premiere it at Cannes. And it's like, <laughs> I feel like, like, you know, when I saw that, I was like, 
Okay, don't get excited, people, because you know what else premiered at Cannes? X Men: The Last Stand. Oh, <laughs> you know. Oh, that hurts me. I know. I know. Oh it's my like, goodness. So it's like no, this film. Don't pull your like, you know. Well, it's premiering at Cannes, so it's a festival <laughs> movie. You know, no. You know, no. you know the legacy of the Cannes Film Festival is that it was explicitly started as a counteract to German film festivals under Nazi regime. Really, I did not know that. Like that's how it started, and they, like. Lindsay, again, we're gonna. I talk a lot about Lindsay Ellis because she's a fucking inspiration, but she did a video on the history of the Hunchback of Notre Dame and movie adaptations of that. And there was one that adds in this element that's not in the book where, you know, the gypsies are coming to France to plead with the King of France to to let them live, to let yeah. them be. Yeah. And premiering that in, in the Cannes Film Festival as a counteract as a counter to, to Nazi Germany propaganda films. That's a huge statement. And then they're also going to premiere Solo. The, a yay? One of these things, question mark? One of these things is not like the other. No, no, yeah. And then, then you know, a movie like Solo, which is just like kind of, sort of, to be honest, I, I mean, who knows? Maybe I'll be eating my hat and it's great. But, you know, to be honest, like, it just looks like the epitome of Hollywood greed to be I, honest because it's like a movie of the, a Han Solo movie that no one asked for that was a disaster like in production like, like prequels like, are just I think Star Wars prequels are a questionable venture in general well yeah I mean not well and look like you know I mean like even Rogue One like like I to this day I think Rogue One is the worst Star Wars film ever made to really? me really really like I mean like, yeah, The Phantom Menace is intolerable, but The Phantom Menace is not boring. Rogue One, like, oh my god, that is the movie, like, I would watch if I, you know, was feeling stressed and severely needed a nap. Like, those characters and that dialogue, so dry and the drab visual design, there's, like, oh, I think there's something horrible. to there's something to exploring the different corners of the Star Wars universe. Yeah, but, 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 but not why, like that. I mean, I, yikes. Why Solo? What, does, yeah. Do we really need more of Han... I, Han I, I get the idea of it. Like, he's maybe the most popular character of the original trilogy. The most popular, but, sure, yeah. But part of that is Harrison Ford's mannerisms part of that, and like, his delivery and his presence. We don't presence, need you know? that story. We don't need to know like who he was or how he got started. What matters no. is who he is in this story because this story is the better one. Yeah. I, well, and, like, and also, like, you know, uh, I remember the New Yorker uh, uh, way back and, and, and I, I, I disagree with this but it's a, an interesting point nonetheless. They were reviewing Batman Begins. And they said, you know, why do we have to do this origin? What's wrong with Batman is? And I, I totally disagree with that. I think you needed to do the origin because you, you needed to see, like, his full transformation as a character. But at the same time, I think that's an interesting idea. Like, some characters, like, I don't want to, like, know ABC, how they became who they are. Like, you know, something like Han Solo, like, I just want him to appear sort of fully formed in the Moss Eisley Cantina and see where he goes from there. Like, to me, it's... It's pedantic to, like, spell out, like, you know, how, like, every Han Soloism came to be, you know? I think, I think for me, it's, it's, it's the idea of, like, when you take characters that are so much of an extreme, and then go for, how do they, how do we get here? Like, Darth Vader, he warrants a backstory. I, we can shit on the prequels all we want, but... But, you, but that's still a great, the arc itself is a great, tragic arc. How you do you, know? how do you end up being, like... The, e the most evil space wizard there is. Yeah, that's like, an interesting Han question. Han Solo is not that remarkable. He's just a guy who's pretty good at flying a ship. Yeah. Who's, pre who's kind of lucky a lot. Right, right. Like they do, and the younger version of him, everything in the trailers so far is yes. just like, yeah, he was just always like that. So what's yeah. the point? Like I, so we're gonna have I like need... smirking jokes about, oh, this is how we got the vest. This is how we got the boots. Like kind of like in, you know, X Men. This is what the Kessel Run is. Things. Yeah, where they do things like, you know, next thing you know, I'll be going bald. Oh ha ha, you know. Yeah, it's like, like no, that's just. And you know, story. that's what the movie's gonna be. It's gonna be the Kessel Run. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Like, and honestly, like, I mean, like Rogue One, like okay, they're they're fighting the Empire, they're fighting the good fight, but like. What is Han Solo even going to do? Because his arc was how he become, goes from being a selfish guy to being a guy who cares about the greater good of the galaxy. It's like, so we're going to go how he becomes a selfish guy who only cares about himself? Because that's... Yeah. I don't know. 
I it's I don't know. I I'm interested to see what Ryan Johnson does with his trilogy. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I I well, don't. I know there's a Boba Fett movie coming out, and I don't want to see that. That might be dead because that would Josh Trank was going to do that. Oh my god. Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah, he was. They they, they booted him off of that because of Fantastic Four, so that that might be dead. Yeah. Oh, so I I just. I, I don't want to see a Boba Fett movie, mostly because I love laughing at Star Wars nerds who think Boba Fett is the hottest shit. And he's I like, am one of those nerds. No, he was killed every, by a blind man. Every It's funny how every podcast, you, I feel like it always comes back to Boba Fett. <laughs> he's he's I lo- awesome. He is awesome. He looks very cool. He does nothing in the movies. He just floats around in a jetpack and he gets killed by blind Han Solo. But but here's the thing. You know what I mean? It's, it's like, and this is getting all like fanboyish and dorky of me, but like... Like kind of like one of the, the fun of those fun things about those original movies is like you know kind of you could look at a character like that and like kind of like use your imagination like you know I remember like going and getting my first Boba Fett action figure and like you know like making up Boba Fett adventures and you know having fun taking off the cape and the jetpack and like what does he look like without that it's like there's a whole Boba Fett experience out there. <laughs> I I still I like making fun of Boba Fett and I don't want to lose that. <laughs> Alright, so, yeah, so, the only other one, the only other movie that I meet, I know for certain that I'm looking forward to is Into the Spider-Verse. Oh, yeah. Because that's, because that. yeah. the animation looks gorgeous, uh, Lord and Miller are writing it, I know they got, yeah. they got booted off Han Solo, but I want to see what they do uh, with this character. Um, I, I blame Lucasfilm more for that <laughs> than them, because Lucasfilm is clearly having serious internal problems. I, yeah. But but to into the Spider Verse, yeah. I mean, uh, <laughs> I you, uh, you probably know this. I I don't like Spider Man Homecoming at all. Such an unnecessary milk toast movie. But into the Spider Verse, it looks weird. It looks zany. The visuals look really inventive. You know, that's that I want to see. It, it feels cool. and it feels like more. It, ha- it has more of a purpose than Spider Verse because Spider Verse or, 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 or Homecoming. Yeah, Homecoming exists to be like. It's right there in the title. It's just the Marvel Studios have Spider-Man again. It, yeah. It, it defines... It's, I, I'm trying to find like a, a good way to say it. It's, it's a movie that's about itself. Yeah, yeah. And that feels weak, you know? Uh, I, I think you're right, because, you know, it's like... I was thinking... Like, I've actually... I was thinking about that at, when, when you talked about that before, and I was thinking, like, 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 that may be the very problem, because, you know, yes many movies are like an allegory of their own creation but then you get into something like that and it's like well it's got about to be about something more and I don't know that it was I know? yeah um I still like Homecoming but it's it's not a strong Spider-Man movie um but Into the Spider-Verse it's I mean you've you got it I feel like it, it will also be about itself but in in, in a better way because it's a Miles Morales story yeah and it's the yeah. story of someone Existing and carrying on this legacy after Peter Parker. Yeah. So yeah. I want to see that story. I have seen that story in 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 the comics, but I want to see it in live action. I want to see this style of animation and this yeah. much care and attention paid to it on this big a scale. So yeah, that's that's one of the one I'm ones I'm looking forward to. Also, you know, I'm an animation junkie, so I'll take any Marvel cartoon I can get. Well, I'm also too, like you know, I mean. I I love the I, I love the superhero genre and I think animation is very underutilized in terms of superheroes because you know when we talk about the greatest superhero movies you know I think well probably all of us bring the Incredibles into the conversation at some point and the, I think there's something to that you know there's something to that that one of the most engaging and entertaining superhero movies is a cartoon you know I mean comics are cartoons in and of themselves so why not try and you know, do more movies in that world where you have this real visual freedom. Because, like, like looking at that Into the Spider Verse trailer, that New York is weird. Like, it's almost yeah. kind of psychedelic. You know, and, like just the bursts of like the red and blue coloring. Yeah, and yeah. they do, and they, and that last shot, like they do the focus shift of him in the subway and then to the spider's web. Like, you don't. That's definitely live action stuff. But seeing it in animation is weird. But I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm here for it, man. I'm I'm here for it. 
Shall we wrap it up? Let's let's wrap it up. We were talking about Isle Dogs first, right? We were, yeah, we've come a long way from uh, Megasaki. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I'm very glad to not be watching that trailer anymore. Yeah. Because yeah. they, they played it in front of every movie at Fox Tower for, like, months. Well, I was I was the same way about uh, the, the Moonrise Kingdom trailer. Like, like, that trailer played so much that I got so sick of, you know, Edward Norton saying, you know, Jiminy Cricket, he flew the coop, and I was so shocked when I watched the movie, and I was like, wow, in context, that's actually funny. It's only <laughs> irritating, because it's like, in the, that damn trailer, over oh, oh. Yeah. So, I, it's problematic, but fun, and I mean, I, I still, I still am a fan of Wes Anderson, so I'll see, I'll see his next feature, probably. Yeah, same here. I'm, I'm, I'm a fan as well, you know, I mean, uh, and, uh, it, as you say, it's very problematic, but I, I think especially if, you know, you're an Anderson file, like, it'll give you something to ponder. Uh, I don't know if I could, like, recommend it to, like, a general audience, because, like, I, like, kind of like, like, a, like the Royal Tenenbaums, you know, like, I would, I would recommend that to anybody. I think, like, anybody could, like, get something out of the Royal Tenenbaums. I Love Dogs, I don't know, it's very, like... It's a little bit of a head scratcher, yeah. to be honest. Like, you know, I, I, even if it has its moments, I, may, it may wor- be worth for me at least to see it again. Um, cause I'm I sure do, I'll see it again someday. I, just you know, as a completist, you I, know, there's definitely day, opportunities. Like, yeah. <laughs> again, three screens. Like the last time we had a movie playing on three screens was opening night for Dunkirk. Well, okay. Oh, oh, yeah. Anderson, Nolan. O tour is a very different stripes. Oh yeah, <laughs> that would be a weird collaboration. Oh yeah, no, that would no. not be a collaboration. That would just be like a month of infighting followed by production has been canceled. <laughs> well, I you know it reminds me of my April Fools joke where I wrote an article saying that Christopher Nolan and Nancy Myers were going to do a movie, <laughs> which which I thought it was going to be. Uh, my idea was so uh, Diane Keaton. Uh, plays a sort of a, a novelist uh, who's having a midlife crisis and then her ex-husband Cobb played by Michael Caine shows up and implants a computer chip in her brain that like distorts reality I don't know about you I'd watch it I want to see that <laughs> I, I, I thought about like what would be the craziest idea for for a movie, and that would be Quentin Tarantino adapting Twilight. <laughs> I would see that. I would that, watch that actually the hell out sounds of that. Are cool. Are you kidding that me? That's fun. That yeah. sounds like just weirdness. Yeah, yeah. Like too bizarre to ignore. Yeah, I mean, the only thing weirder would be if you know he was developing a Star Trek movie. I yeah. Uh, <laughs> eh, eh, eh. All right. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks to all of you for tuning in. Uh, if you like this podcast, then why wouldn't you please click a thumbs up, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Don't forget to like us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter at THO Movie Reviews. And please check out all the great reviews and content, including uh, uh, Mo's review of the death of Stalin. Uh, and uh, my review of Ready Player One and Mo's forthcoming review of Ready Player One which should be up soon uh, yeah. please go there check it out thomoviereviews.wordpress.com uh, once again uh, I'm your host Ben Campbell Ferguson I'm here with Mo Shawnette and from all of us here at THM Movie Reviews woof bye